Uh, hi everyone. Uh, today I'm going to talk about Celery. Uh, this will be an introductory uh, presentation. So if you use Celery in your daily life or familiar with it, this presentation won't add many things to you. But if you don't know anything about Celery or if you find task queues complicated in general, this presentation might be useful for you. So my name is Yiğit. I am from Istanbul, Turkey. And this will be my first EuroPython talk, so wish me luck. Uh, I am a member of Python Istanbul community. Uh, we are making uh, weekly and monthly meetings, and we are planning to organize a PyCon Turkey uh, hopefully next year. So wish you to see there. Uh, I work in Hippo. It's a company where we build products. So uh, companies and startups come us with their ideas and we transform them into applications. And we use Celery heavily in our backend team. So before starting, I want to talk a little bit about the beauty of the Python. In my opinion, the beauty of Python comes from its diverse use. People from many different backgrounds use Python every day. From web development to astronomical calculations, Python is being used everywhere. So it's a great opportunity for web developers to take a great advantage from the huge knowledge of the academical side in their projects. For example, if you are making a website, you can easily integrate an uh, image recognition library uh, just by adding some lines of code. But the same applies for the people from other domains as well. Imagine that you are an academician and working on an algorithm you can easily transform your, pro transform your project to a web project by importing a small micro framework and make it web ready. However, the web itself has a problem. It's patientless. Have you ever seen these kinds of errors? Many. This is mostly happens when uh, the function, the, the Python function, uh, become, uh, gets very slow and cannot provide the response in the given time. So we will get into late detail later. So I created a, an imaginary web page where people uh, get somehow and we get their DNA files and analyze their DNAs and generate a PDF file and send them that PDF file as an email and then show a thank you response. When we look at the uh, runtimes of each function, in our imaginary scenario, getting the user takes only 50 milliseconds, which is possible because probably it's just a database connection. Analyzing the DNA, let's imagine that it takes five minutes, which is, I think, okay in, in these times. And sending the email, it takes about two seconds. And yeah, then we display the thank you message. So let's imagine that you are a visitor of this page. And for the five minutes and two seconds, the only thing that you see is just a white page. This is definitely not the best user experience in 2017. And most probably, you would never see this message because most of the browsers just lose their hopes on web pages that are slower than two minutes. So most likely, your users will just see a white page and then another page, and then they will try again and try again. And after 15 minutes, they will receive three emails with the same PDF files. So what if these two heavy functions could be out of our function? What if there would be a way to give these two functions to someone else, to another process, sometime later, and continue to our routine and display the thank you message. So in that case, we would get rid of these two heavy functions and just give the thank you response to the user in 50 milliseconds. And this is where Celery arrives. This is the exact use case of Celery. When you have a function that you want to outsource, 
Celery comes to your help. Using Celery, you can assign a task to some worker and continue on your routine. We will get into the details later about what a worker is, what a task is. But generally, you can put everything that can be put out of request response cycle. So what this can be? Anything heavy. For example, sending emails. Sending an email can take up to three seconds or maybe more. Or sending push notifications. Imagine that you, are, you need to send 100 push notifications to different people just as a result of, a, of an action. Resizing and editing images are always a pain, especially when you deal with high resolution images and third party uh, data storage solutions like S3. And they are the most common reason of 502 errors, in my opinion. And there are also some tasks that take time, like taking backups, the normalization, and data sync issues with uh, third party integrations. This is an exemplary Celery architecture. Uh, here we see that we have an application, we have a message queue, and we have one or more workers. So this is, we will see these slides many times during this presentation, because this is the basic Celery architecture. We don't uh, care for the result database or anything. This is the simplest possible implementation. So let's look at each element and analyze what they do. The application is our main application. I mean, in this case, it's our view controller function. So this is the part where we want to make it faster. This is the part that wants to outsource some of its tasks to someone else. But it can, it can be a website or any kind of project. Celery has a great support for applications. Uh, because an application just needs to give the function name that uh, it wants Celery to execute and provide necessary arguments. That's all. The application should give the function name, take the arguments, Celery will transform them into pickle or JSON string and record it to the database. Celery has a built-in support for Django uh, because once it was a Django project, now it's open to all Python projects. It has support for Flask, Bottle, Pyramid, and Tornado, and many other frameworks. It even has support for PHP. So if you are writing a PHP, uh, PHP program, you can also use Celery, because all you have to know is the name of the function that you, should, you want to run and the necessary arguments. So, you can even serialize with JSON through a PHP project. And the task queues, this was the main huge thing you see in the middle. And this is very important because Celery needs to record these tasks to a database, to a specialized database, and then process one by one. There are many available uh, task queues. Uh, RabbitMQ, I don't know if you heard of it, but it's a very popular uh, message queue database. Uh, it's, it's the most uh, supported one by Celery, but Redis is also being heavily used with Celery because you can use Celery uh, uh, Redis in other uh, issues as well. For example, you can use the same Celery instance for the caching of your website and the task management. And there is support for other databases for CouchDB, MongoDB, Amazon, SQS, if you don't want to deal with any database. And worker. Worker is a specific term for salary. You can imagine this as another, another application that is written by salary guys. And it will just work and pull the database if there is an new task. So it will always ask, do you have a new task? Do you have a new task? Do you have a new task? Day and night, and when there is a new task, it will mark that task as assigned and process it. So when we look back, we see that the application prepares the task data, which is the name of the function and the arguments 
sends them to the message queue, which is a specialized database. And as all databases do, when they record something on their data, on their data storage, they give an ID. So it gives back the ID so that the application can track the status of that task. Is it processing? Is it processed? There, is there an error or what? And there might be one or multiple workers, but we should have at least one worker to process these tasks in the queue. And they can be anywhere. They can be in the same instance. They can be in different uh, physical machines, difficult, different locations. So let's move our heavy tasks to salary. You remember our example. What we want is to get user DNA information, prepare a PDF file, and email that PDF file to the user. Before doing that, the first thing that we should do is to set up a broker database. This is the biggest dependency of Celery. And for this example, I decided to use Redis uh, because it's very commonly used. And also, we should install Celery through PIP. It's the easiest part. And then, let's look again what we are going to transfer. We are going to take these two functions and give it to Celery. So we create a new file named tasks.py and we create a function inside. So what we do here is basically we have a function that calls these two functions. So when I call this function with DNA file and email, it will first analyze it and then send the email with the attachment. Uh, in order to make this as a salary task, we should import salary and define a salary application. While defining salary application, of course, we can give many details. But as this is an introductory speech, so we just give a name and the broker URL so that salary can connect to this message database uh, while creating tasks and consuming tasks. But this is not enough. We should define that this function belongs to Celery. So we add this uh, decorator on top of it. And thanks to this decorator, Celery will know that it has such a task. So while waking up the worker, it will look for the tasks and it will prepare a list of tasks that it knows and it will execute when the right time will come. And we go back to our view function and we get the user and we give the DNA file and the user. So when we execute this function in this form, what we will see will not surprise us. We will see five minutes of white screen and then a message, maybe. Because we just called that function. We didn't want to, uh, that salary. Uh, we didn't transfer this to a salary task. So what we have to do is to add a delay at the end of the function. This is a shorthand, uh, shortcut function. There are other ways to do that with uh, more information. But when we add this delay at the end of the function, the Python will not run this function, but instead of it, salary package will create the task by the function's na function name and the two arguments we sent and record it to the database. And as soon as it, it gets recorded to the database and gets the ID, it will continue to its routine and display the thank you message. So as Redis and other databases are quite fast, maybe in in a couple of milliseconds, it will pass that part and display the user a nice message. So the user will not wait for that task. It's nice. The user is happy, uh, solve the message, but he will not receive the message. If you wait five minutes, 10 minutes, a day, there will be no email in the inbox. Why? Because there is no worker yet. 
we recorded it into the database. We know that we have to execute this task, but there is no one to execute. So we should wake up a worker. This is the easiest way to wake up a worker. This, uh, I open these log levels to better visual, visualization. And if we type this function and we have salary installed, this, is, this will be what we see. By the way, in salary, if you don't see any red lines, this means that you are very lucky. Everything is okay. It connected to database. Everything is good. And here you can see the tasks. You see there is a list of tasks. So this item uh, is known by salary. So if salary sees such a task, it will just go and execute it. And as soon as we run the salary worker, we will see this line. Because we already recorded a new task in the task database. And it will receive the task and start working on it. And after about five minutes, we will see the completion message of this task. This is just five minutes because I just put some sleep functions inside. And another nice part about Celery is that, as you know, some, there are some functions that can create problems, especially third-party integrations. When you make an integration with an email service or an integration with a push notification service, there is a great chance that they can, they can have some technical problems. And if you do this in your view controller functions, this will mean that your website will, uh, will crash because of the third parties. And if you put everything inside a try function, it will not give error to a user, but it will not make the job. So one of the biggest advantages of using Celery is that you can just retry tasks. For example, you can set a task uh, retry limit. For example, you can say, retry this task three times by waiting one minute before each trials. This way, you can improve the chance of executing your uh, required tasks. Also, salary tasks can create new tasks. So if you will iterate over thousands of users and send them emails, you don't need to do this in once. You can just have a function that generates other salary, function, uh, salary tasks. This way, when you iterate over a list and generate thousands of new tasks, the workers will go on one by one over these tasks and execute them. And if one of them fails, only that little one will be executed again. This is a huge advantage, especially if you are dealing with emails, because the worst thing that can happen to a developer is not to shut down the server, but send wrong emails. Because if you shut down the server, only the people who are on the site will see that you did some bad things. But if you send wrong emails, everybody will see those emails. Or push notifications, they are the same. So Celery is quite useful on handling these kind of errors situations. And in Celery, there is also a great uh, tool that we frequently use, periodic tasks. In my opinion, any website or any project sooner or later will require periodic tasks. In order to run periodic tasks, we have a tool named Celery Beat. It comes inside the Celery package, and it's quite easy to set up. However, many people confuse Celery Beat because they think that if they have workers alive and if they define the Celery Beat periodic tasks, everything will work smoothly. But in fact, that's not true because workers just accept tasks or they cannot uh, invoke uh, new, new tasks by themselves. So you can, you can think Celery Beat as a separate application that sends tasks to the message queue. So you should imagine just like your application. So you have to keep your application alive using supervisor or something like that. And you have to keep your workers alive 
also you have to keep the celery meat process alive. There are three types of schedules. Uh, time delta schedules are the easiest one. You just give a time interval and the task just runs. This is dependent to the start time of the uh, celery beat. So if you start celery beat 30 seconds after the task will be initiated, 30 seconds after the task will be created again, so and so forth. If you have if, if you need to have more control on when the task will be fired, you can use cron top schedules and you can say send this, uh, do this thing at this time. For example, in this case, we are sending email digest every Friday at 5.30 p.m. And it's that easy to implement this. The only thing that you should take attention is the time zone, of course, because this will be uh, fired by the time zone of the server. So please be aware. And there are solar sh schedules as well. If you want to fire tasks by the position of the earth and sun, you, you can use this one. For example, if you want to fire an new task when it's sunset at Istanbul, you can just give solar sunset and the coordinates of Istanbul and it will send a new task just at the right moment when it's the sunset at Istanbul. There are different types. So there are dusk civil, dusk nautical, dusk astronomical. So if you have time, you can check all of these and find the best one. There are great additions. The, the one that I want to talk will be Flower because I don't have too much time. Flower is the tool to monitor your salary workers, how they do, is, uh, are they processing the tasks. So I strongly suggest you to use Flower if you use salary. And some last words. It's a great and simple tool uh, for time consuming tasks. I know that there are many people who hate salary. I think they have a club of salary haters. But I think this is mostly because old versions, the new version, especially the version 4, is quite stable. And if you had bad experiences with Celery, I suggest you to give it a try again. You, won't, uh, you will be surprised. You should, uh, you should never forget that arguments will be serialized and then saved. So never pass Django models as an argument because they will be serialized as a string. And if you do that, you will have problems, uh, corrupt data problems and everything. And Celery sometimes is too easy to cover architectural problems. So imagine that you have a faulty architecture and you just remove everything uh, or you make too much denormalizations. And then instead of fixing this thing and removing the denormalizations, you can easily get into the trap of using celery to uh, prepare those denormalizations. Uh, it will be a bad decision, so please avoid that. So I think I'm in time, and thank you. Yeah. Thank you very much. Very interesting. I hope there are many questions. Yeah, so I think here was the first one. Yeah. yeah. Uh, OK, uh, thank you for the talk. And I have several questions, but I have uh, probably the most interesting one. Is like how would you compare Celery to more like workflow operation tools like uh, Luigi or Airflow? And like uh, when tasks have dependency on each other, that you told like the task can produce other tasks. So like this most interesting. And I have like three minor questions. Yeah. Should I ask him right? Personally, now? I didn't use those the other ones, so, so I, you don't I, know. Yeah. Okay, and. Uh, the question for a queue, you told that there are several backends supported and does Celery try to normalize uh, some guarantees for queues? Because like you mentioned SQS and SQS doesn't guarantee you order mm -hmm. and also it doesn't guarantee exactly once rule for task queue. Mm -hmm. And like uh, what if, if you use SQ, SQS as is, there is a chance that wor uh, two workers, workers will receive one message. Yes, we experienced many problems with SQS and 
for, for six months we used SQS in many projects, but we had many problems with Celery. I don't know why, but they just didn't work or the problems that you mentioned happened. Mm -hmm. The same task uh, receiving by two workers. So we, we went back to RabbitMQ. With RabbitMQ, it's quite easy to set up and you feel that it's the, it's the original one that is written for. So if you have big queues and if you have complex queue operations, I strongly suggest to have RabbitMQ, not Redis, not anything else, uh, but RabbitMQ or a similar me specific message queue uh, system. Okay, and like another question is about CronTap scheduler. Mm -hmm. because your example was very simple, but for instance, in normal cron, at least in standard, standard cron, there are issues with schedules like last Sunday of months. We didn't experience any problem. I'm using for... So, like, is it based on cron or, like, it's a separate implementation of cron scheduler? In my, as far as I know, it's a separate implementation. But the biggest problem with cron tabs is that when you change one of the schedules, as it records it to a text file, the last uh, runtime, uh, it creates problems. So, it might be possible that it is being fired before you want. So what I do generally at the beginning of each Celery task that will be fired by a cron task is to add a control key and add something to Redis with some expire time and make sure that it will never ever run before time. Especially this is crucial in, in, in mailings because for example if you want to send a mailing at Friday and you change the time in Monday you, it just gets fired. So uh, we add control blocks at the beginning of the tasks. Okay, and final question uh, about your, you had an application uh, object of salary at import time. You so instantiated in import, import time. Does mm -hmm. it have side effects of like creating connection when just you import, when, when you create an instance? Or yep. it's lazy? I didn't experience any problem. Like, because like when you start testing it, you have import side effects. And import yep. side effects is generally bad practice. Yeah, but I didn't experience any bad problem. Okay, from. thank you. Thank you. Next questions? Next questions? Yeah. Let's do something for diversity. <laughs> Hi, thank you for the talk, first of all. And uh, the question is, what is the advantage of the salary if I'm using it only for the background workers um, in comparison to Uwiski as Pula, for instance? Uh, in my opinion, the biggest advantage is that you can use Celery from anywhere, so you don't need to, uh, you don't need to operate with only a single thing. And you can send tasks from various locations. You can use, I don't know if that supports, for example, periodic tasks. So if you have a Celery installed in your architecture, you can just use it in, in many tasks as possible. And also, I don't know if they have retry or not. They have. they have. I didn't know. Okay, so I think one more question, and I think he's still over there, so I think you can ask him all the questions. I'm pretty sure if you will. Yeah. Okay, so, yeah. Thank you for the talk. So you were saying you're using this heavily in production. Do you have any tips on how to operate salary efficiently? What kind of message queue do you use? You mentioned before on the other mm -hmm. question that you switch from the Amazon service to mm -hmm. Rabbit and Q. Mm -hmm. And is that what you use in production for yeah, large definitely. scale setup? Yeah, uh, we, we tried with Redis and RabbitMQ. It both works very well, but RabbitMQ is of course better. The only problem that I see when you have too many tasks, I mean like millions of tasks, I have some friends here that, that are dealing with some uh, e-commerce business and yeah, there might be problems. When you have too much uh, tasks, you should uh, take attention to, to the overall uh, performance of the system because there might be object dependencies, the same objects might be reached by different tasks and you should avoid that as much as possible because it gets the code complicated, it gets uh, debugging complicated, so you shouldn't too much rely on tasks, especially to periodic tasks. 
Okay, and what happens if you have a task that fails mid-time? Do you just raise an exception or do you split it in two parts? Say exactly like uh, you had analyzed DNA and then send email. Say send email fails. Does that mean that you fail the entire uh, it's query it's or you just try to... Entire it? task fails. Okay, that seems inefficient. You yeah. waste five hours of compute time for two seconds. Yeah, so that's why you can you can divide into subtasks and okay, generate. Okay, so you can recursively create stuff from analyze DNA. You then uh, schedule a send email. Yes. Okay, that seems more efficient. Thank you. Thank you. Okay, so let's thank E again.